speaking with Brother Sage here in uh, in South Bend. Brother Sage, I appreciate your taking some time out of your schedule here and meeting with me. Um, you know, one thing I wasn't clear on, what, is, what exactly is your capacity or your involvement with Notre Dame University? Well, my involvement with Notre Dame is back in 1990, we started a program called the Black Man Think Tank, where I met my wife, incidentally. Uh, I'm still connected with him with Black Man Think Tanks. I've spoken a couple times. I do lectures out there. Uh, I've never taught at Notre Dame, but I have taught at Indiana University South Bend, Southwest Michigan College, and I've done a lot of work with St. Mary's. So I'm a retired person, formerly with the um, Department of Transportation. Prior to that, you know, I was director of the Urban League. Prior to that, um, I worked with troubled youngsters and the juvenile justice system. So um, at 70 soon to be, I've been blessed with a lot of rich skill development, but I'm retired from nine to five. I just do things now based on my interests, my love, and telling the story of the proud African experience. Now, you know, I first became aware of you when I was headed down to Richmond a few uh, days ago to speak with the mayor there. So I decided to stop by the Levi Coffin House and met the lady there. And she spoke very highly of you, and she was surprised that I didn't know who you were. And that's why I had to kind of investigate and, and eventually uh, make it here. How did you become involved uh, in the Underground Railroad here in Indiana? In 1926, George Mendenhall, a slave owner in Virginia, wrote a letter to Levi Coffin and asked him to help his slave and their wife get away and he wanted them to go to Cincinnati or Franklin, Indiana, where the Coffin House is located. And in 1929, they got two flatbeds with horses and some livestock and some food and set out from that section of Virginia, came through what today is West Virginia, through Kentucky, into Ohio, into Indiana, where Levi Coffin's property is, and that happened in 1829. So we lived there. We we lived there probably for about, well, Dicey was James and Dicey Ampey, which is my namesake. My mother's last name was Ampey. She's no longer with us. But she was the Ampeys in Iowa. I can tell you about Ampeys in, in Massachusetts, in South Carolina, Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Utah, Nebraska, Minnesota, we're all over the place because when we came up north, we decided to make north our home and branched all over the country. So that's how the Levi Coffins got to know me. As a matter of fact, I have ancestors buried in the cemetery in Franklin, Indiana, where Levi Coffin House is. So the persons you talk with, I call my white cousins. Okay, and they know me because of the work I do with the Underground Railroad. So that's a little bit of the story. It's really long and involved, and I'd take up your whole tape. It's just that the more I study about my ancestry and my past, as of you, okay, the more I find out that these stories weren't taught to me when I was a youngster. So I have to teach them to myself and to my young people so my granddaughters, my grandbabies can carry on the tradition. But what originally stimulated the interest? You know, when you start hearing about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, you ask yourselves, where and how do I fit? Okay, nobody could ever explain that to me, so I decided to explain it to myself. The only way I could do that is to do history and doing research and delving into my family past, my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, I can take it all the way back to the mother continent. I am Ghanaian. I'm a cross between the Ashante and the Akan. I speak the religion of the Twi. So you see how far back I go? And there's a passion there. That passion is important to me, and I want to continue telling that story as long as I possibly can so my offspring can continue telling the story also. But why is that important 
what does that do for your offspring for them to know that how does that perhaps psychologically enhance something about themselves well it's sort of like a tree a tree can't grow without roots that's our roots and I want to make certain that my family tree continues to grow and the only way that can happen is the younger roots continue telling the story. I think that's extremely important. You know, so when my granddaughter last February for Black History Month at her school in Atlanta, Georgia, talked about the Civil War, well, she was able to grab members from my family that fought in the Civil War to tell the color aspect of the Civil War you don't find much about civil war with African Americans, but had it not been for us, the North wouldn't have won that war. My granddaughter was able to not only talk about Harriet Tubman and her role in the Underground Railroad and her role in being a military officer for the North, but also about Thomas Ampey, who was killed at the Battle of Fort Wagner. So when you see the movie Glory, that's my family story. You know, when you um, hear today, you know, young people talk about uh, how they find history boring and, and, and uh, they just can't really get into it. Why do they say that? I mean, what, what, what do they get lost at, in, you know, to, to say something like that? Well, a lot of it stems from the fact that never do they ever study history about themselves except for Martin Luther King, maybe Frederick Douglass, maybe, maybe a few people. But we've invented over 100,000 things in this country. There's science. You know, we won the Revolutionary War. The first person killed in the Revolutionary War was Christmas Addicts, okay? You know, they don't know the Christmas Addicts was a six foot four, 235-pound, 28-inch waist black man. As a matter of fact, the first person killed, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth were all black men who told the British redcoats we ain't going for that and they weren't even free they were slaves okay they have no knowledge of the role we have played in this country to be where we're at today and when i share that with them they're surprised because they'd never heard that before and then we can't fault the teachers because their white teachers were never taught about the african-american experience so what you and i and others like us have to do is tell the African-American experience, because when we do, our children will listen. That presents an interesting dilemma, because I have personally found black people who won't believe something unless a white person says it. Right, right. Yeah, there are people like that. But see, we suffer from color consciousness. We suffer from cultural schizophrenia. We call, suffer from black racial self-hatred. Cultural schizophrenia, what is that? Cultural schizophrenia, meaning that we're maybe, as Francis Fanon talks about in Wretched of the Earth, he also wrote another book called Black Skin, White Mask. Okay, so we have difficulty knowing who we are. I mean, some of us have to put on a white shirt with a red, white, and blue flag as a tie. Other people can put on a dashiki, okay? We don't really know who we are. We subscribe to what I characterize as the popular culture. We want to be smart. We want to be popular and not smart. Well, for the record, uh, my tie represents uh, not only did my Hackleys die in the Civil War, mm -hmm. they died in the Revolutionary War. And I've even, I've even found my first black Hackley, black male Hackley, because the ones before him were white. Right. And I use my tie so that I can slide up and down the scale so that if I find someone who is too pro-America, I can correct them with the things that America has done to people. Or if they're too much against America, I can correct them to show that our limited rights and that kind of thing. I mean, I See, to me, you are a beautiful human being, regardless of whether you wear red, white, and blue tie to go with your white shirt or a dashiki the fact that you're hungry to find out about yourself and to tell your story there's nothing wrong with you okay and what i would do if kids were here or youngsters were here i would say this is eric hackley and i am brother sage okay we want to tell 
our story. We would like for you to listen. Could you possibly provide us the courtesy of listening and then give us feedback as to what you think? It could very easily be done. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with you. As a matter of fact, you're precious beyond recognition. You know, but the bottom line is our youngsters need to be motivated to listen to why they exist and who they are and the purposes they represent. If we ever expect them to do anything in the future, that's the approach that's going to have to be taken. But, you know, here in Indiana, uh, we've been having a lot of discussions about the Redskins, and we've always had discussions about black people. <clears throat> then I found out that there were actual um, congressional acts to not only remove the Native Americans from Indiana, but, again, the article... Um, 1851 Constitution of Indiana, Article 13 says that, again, uh, blacks had to pay a bond just to come into Indiana. That was part of the Colonization, Recolonization Act. Um, once upon a time, we can almost say that Indiana didn't want black people here. Yeah, most definitely. As a matter of fact, it's important to note that Indiana was a sundown state. A sundown state meaning that if you're caught in Indiana after 6 o'clock, you could be lynched, okay? And a lot of us didn't understand that. We knew Indiana was, was strange, was awkward, compared to a place like Ohio, where you had almost 75,000 people escape through slavery to go to freedom up in Canada or parts of Michigan, even parts of Indiana. But Indiana was not user-friendly to us, if we want to use today's modern terms. If you came to Indiana back in 1850, 1860, 1840, 1830, you're subject to get your head chopped off, okay? So what we have to understand is Indiana was Indiana during that period of time. It was what's known as the Northwest Territory, okay? But there were safe places for us. Ohio was one. Indiana was not. Michigan was another one, okay? So what we have to do is show people how all that came about, and how there was a glorious future from our past. It's interesting that you would say that, because my Hackleys were in Chillicothe. Uh, the last one born in Chillicothe, I think, was born in, in 1838 or so. Uh, I'm sorry, 1848, right, right, right around that time period. But anyway, I found an article that said that, that as they were trying to find uh, the ideal place for their barber shops, but they they did not want to go to Indiana because Indiana was too racial, right. and they went on to Niles, Michigan, and set up shop there. Um, wh why do you th why why do you feel that Indiana was that way? I mean, was it William Henry Harrison? What I mean, what what was the mindset of early Indiana people to make them anti-black people and anti-Native American? Well. Even today, we find a lot of people, even though they say they're not racist or prejudiced, they are. Um, if we go back and take a look at the history of America, the only reason why 750,000 to 1.5 million people came to the United States was to be slaves. Okay? 90% of the people who are brown skinned like you and I our ancestors came from Africa through that peculiar institution known as Middle Passageway or as slavery, okay? And people back in that period of time saw us on a class race basis and we weren't as good as they were. We could work the property so they could go to the bank. However, we weren't as good as they were. We weren't as bright as they were. We came from Africa, that stigma that the people in Africa don't know any better. All right? So a lot of the history of prejudice and racism that plagues this country comes as a result of you and I not trying to share with people from another culture as to how we all got set up to be the way we are. And that kind of dialogue needs to take place. My wife used to do a program at IUSB called Conversations on Race, where we could actually talk about why we act the way we do and why some people are more prejudiced than others. I mean, when I had my radio program on WSBT, I even had KKK members call up and say that they couldn't talk to me because I was a nigger, okay? 
And I would say, well, if you can't talk to me, why are you calling? This is my program. Well, they called because they wanted to put their 10 cents worth in. And naturally, I invited them on the program. They could even come with their outfits on if they had to. I just wanted to have honest dialogue and communication with them. So, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. And uh, since you and I are just turning 21, we might as well get at it. You know, it was interesting that you would say that because I met Jeff Berry, who was a, uh, out of Auburn. Uh, with the, He was the Imperial Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And they had rallies in Fort Wayne. And uh, so I attended, of course. I took my camera there, and I filmed the whole thing. And uh, then he said that they're going to have a, a rally in Auburn. I went. Uh, but before I went to Auburn, I called him. And he said, uh, are you Afro-American? I said, yes. He said, that's interesting because he had an a Afro-American on the other line that wanted to interview him. I said, that's why I'm calling, too. This man actually agreed to do an interview with me in Fort Wayne. But I wanted to do the interview at the mayor's office because that's the only place I was safe because the black fools and the white fools would come out throwing stones and what have you. But this man actually agreed to meet with uh, myself, Nation of Islam, NAACP, and Urban League. I mean, I brought the whole crew. I was going to have the whole crew there. He didn't have a problem with it. He wanted. He said that he didn't, he didn't like. He said he didn't. He said he didn't like niggas, but he likes black people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, don't I don't like niggas either. I, I like black people, though. I mean, we get into the whole naming thing, African-American, Afro-American, black, colored, Negro, nigger. You know, in my class, we always go through that distinction as to what would you prefer to be called? Because, see, we don't know what we are. Most of us don't know we're African-American. I took it one step further. I'm not African-American. I'm a proud, diasporan African-American. That what is a proud diasporan African? My people were dispersed diasporan from Africa, and I was born in America. Okay, that's the label I've given myself because everybody else gives us labels. You know, but we need to talk about that because a lot of our black youngsters don't know why they use that word nigger. We need to make it clear. They need to understand what that word represents, where it comes from. There's a lot that needs to happen we got a lot of work to do. As we get ready to wind down here, you know, what... Uh, right now, I'm going across the state. I'm here in South Bend today. Uh, I was in uh, Rochester earlier. Uh, so far, I've been to Richmond, Franklin. Why is it uh, important? I, I feel that it's important, but I, I, I need a second opinion on this here. To, uh, I think that people across Indiana need to share their perspectives of history and also the history of their particular communities. Because by sharing the history of their particular communities, it'll give us a more complete picture of Indiana. And, uh, and it's important to hear a geographic cross-section of people talking about why history is important because right now I've noticed that people in Fort Wayne don't know the history of this side of the state. People from Gary don't know about Fort Wayne and nobody knows about the history of Lafayette and Tecumseh and what have you or Terre Haute or whatever the case is. It seems like we have an illiteracy that we can actually fix ourselves but there's no incentive to do so because people of Indiana aren't really, they don't really care about sharing their stories across the state, but you seem to want to share your story across the state. Well, not only a, a, across the state, I want to share my story across the United States. You know, I'm a member of the National Park Services. There are over 40,000 routes for the Underground Railroad in the United States, in Canada, in the Caribbean, and in Mexico. Okay, when you start linking all these routes together, you begin to realize what a remarkable people we are. Okay, now not everybody wants to hear that, but you do, I do, others do, and we have to do what we can do in telling that story. I want to commend you for what you do, okay? You know, I'm really excited to be able to do this for you, but at the same time, I want to see where you go with this and see if I can help you, you know, because the more help we have with each other, 
the more it's easier for us to tell our story. Okay? So keep doing what you're doing. And I don't care if you do wear a red, white, and blue tie. All right? You keep doing it. Don't stop. But organize it in such a way. Come up with a clear-cut plan. And um, let's network and go on and put this bad boy together so we can show people what a remarkable people we are. Thank you very much. May God bless you, my brother. Is that good enough? Wow, that was awesome. <laughs>